Thanks very much, Trevor. Can, can everyone hear me? I think I've got this hooked up. Okay, what I'd like to do today is to um, expand on an issue, of course, that's right at the forefront of news these days, which is the climate change issue. I'd like to put it into a much broader context because, in fact, climate change is a symptom of a broader challenge that contemporary societies face. Uh, and so I'll, I'll use some concepts and organize my talk around some concepts that you may not be so familiar with compared to climate change, in particular global change, which is significantly different from climate change, includes climate change, but, in, but uh, includes much more. And then a newer concept called the Anthropocene, uh, which is the new geological era or epoch that a lot of us believe the Earth is now headed into, and in fact is already in. So let's get started and see if we can, there we go and talk a little bit about what we call the Anthropocene era, using the concept of global change to describe what we mean by this. What about before the Anthropocene, before about 1800? Hum the human enterprise really changed quite sharply around 1800 and again at 1950, uh, and I'll talk about that in a moment. A lot of people say, though, well, what's new? Humans have always affected the environment. Uh, this isn't anything new. Well, in fact, it is quite new and different. Because when you look at what we call the pre-Anthropocene events, things in the deep past of, of humans, uh, we did in fact the, uh, affect the environment. You can see some of the ways. So-called fire stick farming, which was used here in Australia, but on other continents too. Uh, and it was most often used to convert already dry ecosystems uh, into less woody and more grassy systems, uh, which is better for the prey that people used to live on. But uh, it maintained ecosystems in those states. A little bit more serious were the megafauna extinctions, uh, which were large-scale, um, continental-scale extinctions of, of large Pleistocene mammals, uh, most prominently in Eurasia, things like uh, the saber-toothed tiger and woolly mammoth, but also here in Australia with giant wombats and giant kangaroos, also in North America. There's a lot of debate on, on whether there were uh, climate changes also involved uh, in those extinctions, but it's pretty clear that they corresponded with the arrival of, of modern humans in those continents uh, migrating out of Africa about 85 or so thousand years ago is when that migration occurred. But the important thing is there's no discernible f effect on how the Earth as a whole functions. And that's the critical thing about the Anthropocene and the, thing that, the point I'm making that, that, that we're now in a very different situation is that we've become so numerous and so active and so powerful in how we, we can manipulate uh, the resource around us, that in fact we now are a geophysical force, and, we ha and up until 1800 uh, we were not a geophysical force at all. So what are some of the evidences that we are now uh, in the year 2009, and indeed in the couple centuries before that, beginning to affect the Earth uh, at the scale of the planet as a whole? Well, this is an obvious one, um, climate change. Here we see a surface temperature record for the northern hemisphere. We don't have one yet for the southern hemisphere, we're working on that. The data is a lot more sparse down here. But you can see as you go along this trace, nearly 2,000 years, these are estimates of natural variability uh, using various proxies of temperature, things like uh, tree ring records or coral records or so on, uh, biological processes which depend upon temperature for their rates. So we can back out what temperature would have been. The shading are the error bars around those estimates of temperature, and you can see perhaps some warm periods around the medieval time here, and you can see the little ice age quite clearly here. But the red line at the end is the contemporary uh, instrument-based temperature record that we have now. And you can see that what's happening to temperature is unusual compared to the natural pattern of variability. It's rising much more sharply than anything we've seen in the past. And already the temperature is at the year 2000 is outside of that envelope of natural vari variability going back in time, going back uh, probably to the mid-Holocene, which was five or 6,000 years ago. So here we see definite influence of human activity, which is pushing the planet outside the envelope of natural variability. But we can see it in other areas too. Uh, in terms of the snow and ice on the planet, there are many changes we observe. Here's one of them. This is the Arctic sea ice. 1979 was the first year that we had satellite imagery. This is showing the extent of that sea ice at the end of the northern hemisphere of summer. Here we see it in 2003, and you can see visually it shrunk quite a bit which is consistent with the strong warming that's occurring in the northern high latitudes. But we can see it on non-climate parts of the Earth system as well. We can see it in the biosphere. Here's an example of the marine biosphere and how humans have affected it. This is the catch of cod off Newfoundland in the North Atlantic. 
from the year 1850 to almost the present time, the year 2000. And you can see what happens, quite striking. Catches slowly go up through this 100-year period. And then in 1950, there's an enormous spike. You might ask, what happened? Well, that's when we got mechanized fisheries after the Second World War, uh, with a lot better uh, tools for tracking fish and a lot better tools for capturing them. But unfortunately, humans forgot that they were working on an active biological system with its own limits. And they were happy as Larry, catching more and more fish and getting more and more profitable until they overran the capacity of the ecosystem to continue producing. And the fish stocks crashed very badly all the way down to below the historic levels, crept up a little bit, and then crashed again. Now, why have I marked 1992? Well, that's the year they first put a ban on fishing. And you might say, why did it take so long after this big crash? See, this is in the 1970s. It took another 20 years before they banned fishing. This is just gives you an idea of how slow institutions can be in responding to very clear signals from the environment. Perhaps we see that now in the climate change area. But it's on terrestrial, the terrestrial surface that humans have had the most impact because we, in fact, are, we're not marine organisms ourselves, although we rely on marine resources. We're terrestrial creatures. And we've modified the terrestrial biosphere more than any other part of the Earth's system. And you see it's all the way on the landscape scale here. You see a quite industrialized landscape with a neat and tidy river system and, and plantations going off into the distance. You can hardly see a skerrick of natural uh, ecosystem in that photograph. And of course, all the way down to the genetic level, where we're now modifying the basic um, determinants of, of organisms themselves uh, to suit human needs. So it's quite a pervasive influence on terrestrial ecosystems. We can look at the other ways in which humans are affecting the environment as well. This is quite an interesting one, because this is the, the, the virtual water flow that's bound up in the trade of grains, in, 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 term, in terms of, of cereal grains. What, what is virtual water? Well, it takes water to grow wheat, rice, corn, and so on. And you know how much this is if you're a farmer, whether it's rain-fed or irrigated. So we can actually calculate, depending on the amount of trade, how much water is being moved around the planet uh, in the form of food. And this is what the result is. And you can see the size of these arrows is the amount of water that's being moved. Now, it's interesting that there are, there are two major sources of virtual water. One, obviously, is North America with huge amounts of water flowing out of that continent to other parts of the world. But interestingly, another fairly big area is Australia. We're the driest inhabited continent, and yet we're exporting quite significant amounts of our water in the form of food trade. We could do that for nitrogen. We could even do it for carbon as well. Again, it shows that humans have become a, glo a global geophysical force by being able to move materials, being able to move elements like nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon, being able to move energy, and being able to move think substances like water around the planet in very big amounts. So if we look at the, this phenomenon we call global change, and this is what global change is about. It's not just about climate. It's about the very many different ways that humans are affecting the functioning of the Earth as a whole. Here's the nitrogen cycle. Now, the top panel is the nitrogen cycle in 1890, before we developed ways of fixing or making, uh, making this unreactive atmospheric nitrogen, N2, into reactive nitrogen. It takes fossil fuels to do that. So this is the natural nitrogen cycle, a huge arrow. Natural ecosystems pull down nitrogen. That's what leguminous plants do. And they fix it, they make it reactive, and plants can use it as a nutrient. Well, that's a constraint, though. There's a limited amount that, that nature provides. Human numbers were bumping into that constraint. So what we devised was artificially fixing nitrogen and using it as fertilizer. This is this arrow here in the year 1990. So in 100 years, we've now overwhelmed the natural fixation of nitrogen with artificial fixation of nitrogen. The problem is not all of that lands up in our food. We actually waste a lot of it, and it goes back through the environment, through all these different processes. I won't walk you through them. All you need to do is look at the size of the arrows at the top and the size of the arrows at the bottom, and you can see that human activities have vastly modified the nitrogen cycle, even more than the carbon cycle. It's all driven by one huge valve, which is this, and then it just flows through. So we're understanding now how we're affecting basic element cycles. Uh, looking at, at the hydrological cycle, the water cycle, these red dots around here are where there are large dams on rivers, where rivers no longer flow freely to the sea. And it's virtually everywhere. The only large rivers which still flow to the sea are basically in Siberia uh, 
and northern Canada. Everywhere else, they're dammed and used by humans. <coughs> We've intercepted probably around half of the natural flow of water that goes into the sea. This is what we've done to the land surface. These colored areas are cultivated systems, that is where 30% or more of the landscape uh, is in intensive cropland. This doesn't include grazing areas, which are also to some extent modified by humans. You can see huge areas, particularly in North America, Europe, East Asia, and South Asia, which are almost entirely cultivated systems. Those areas which are blanks on the map are basically too dry, which is here and there, or too cold, which is there and way up there. The only exceptions, the only maneuverability humanity has in terms of increasing the land for agriculture is to cut down tropical forests. Here, there, and there are some bits left here in Asia, but not too many. The only alternative to, to, we have to feeding the two or three billion people we're going to get by mid-century, additional people, is by intensifying, growing more food on the land that we've got. And of course, climate is part of global change too, and we can see it in many different ways. We can see more intensive storms in the North Atlantic. That's now been well documented. This is the famous one. This is Hurricane Katrina uh, heading up toward New Orleans. The color coding is the sea surface temperature. That's where these storms get their energy and sea surface temperature is rising around the world. And of course, we have the iconic temperature record. This is now a global surface temperature record uh, from 1850 to the present. You see a lot of variability from year to year and even uh, periods of a decade or so uh, where things don't look to, uh, not like they're changing too much, but the overall trend is quite clear and we have a very good understanding of the reasons for that. Now, <coughs> one of the things we did uh, as part of the international program I worked for for about five or six years ago was to say let's try to put all this together and see how humanity is changing, what we call the human enterprise is changing, and see what impacts that has on the global environment. So what we've attempted to do in these, these 12 panel figures is to take a time frame from 1750 to the year 2000, it's the same in every single one of those, and that's to capture the human enterprise before the Industrial Revolution, through the Industrial Revolution to the present. And on each of these vertical scales, we've made them linear, not logarithmic, linear, to make sure that you get the picture of what the Earth system really feels as humanity changes. So these are now, these, th this is not, these aren't environmental curves, these are socioeconomic curves associated with human society. So here we have some very basic ones, simply population, total GDP, that's simply the economic uh, development of humanity. There's foreign direct investment, now we have some resource use, damming of rivers, water use, there's the fertilizer consumption I talked about. Uh, here we have urbanization, paper consumption. We used McDonald's restaurants because we wanted a single indicator for globalization. And that turned out to actually be a very good one. Um, and here's transport and communication. Uh, and you can see all those. But the interesting thing is they all rise uh, through this period. But there is something very interesting about the year 1950, after the Second World War. The human enterprise changed fundamentally uh, as a result of the war and the aftermath. In each of these curves, either the slope changed at 1950 or the curve actually only began at 1950. Look at foreign direct investment. Look at international tourism. Indeed, look at motor cars that we take for granted. My grandparents certainly didn't have them. It wasn't common until after the Second World War for ordinary people to be able to afford motor cars. Now we claim we can't get by not just with one of them. Most people or most families have multiple motor cars, at least in Western countries. So you see, 1950 was an absolute break point uh, in the human enterprise. Now if we try to track what's happened to the global environment, we can do exactly the same thing using the same time scale, 1750 to 2000. Again, linear vertical scale. Here are the three famous greenhouse gases at the top. Uh, you can see what's happening to them. There's ozone depletion. These are the only two that are actually climate. There's the temperature in the northern hemisphere uh, and there's the number of large floods around the earth. Here's what we've done to ocean ecosystems in terms of fisheries. Here's coastal zone. This is the conversion of mangroves into prawn farms. Uh, here's nitrogen going through the coastal zone. Here are a couple of land-based ones and this is what's happening to biodiversity in terms of extinction, shooting up rapidly. We're now moving into the earth's sixth great extinction event. So this is really global change uh, in action. Uh, and you can see it's much more than climate change. But again, the curves have a similar characteristic. 
they're all accelerating. Uh, the interesting thing is the 1950 breakpoint isn't so clear here as it is in the human enterprise. And there's a good reason for that. This is a complex system we're dealing with. Parts of it are buffered and will not feel the full effect for decades into the futures. Some respond more quickly. Uh, so you will get a variety of timescales. But nevertheless, the human imprint on the global environment, and these are global aggregates. These aren't things just happening in one place or a few places. They're, they're figures that are aggregated globally. Uh, you can see that humanity now has become a geo geophysical force, which is pushing a lot of these systems beyond the bounds of their own natural variability. Well, what's this 1950 and post-1950 all about? Well, we labeled it a few years ago at a, at a conference. We called it the Great Acceleration, uh, and that refers to the explosion of human numbers, human activity, and so on. Well, what happened? Well, globalization was certainly part of it. And if you look at network theory, it's really interesting. You start connecting nodes of a network, whether it's flowing information or whether it's flowing materials or energy, and not much happens until you hit a critical level of connectivity. Then the whole network comes alive and things flow much more quickly, highly nonlinear. We believe this happened with the human enterprise after the Second World War. It got connected really quickly, and by 1960 or 1970, we hit that threshold, and things were accelerating quite strongly. There was an emergence of armies of scientists and technology, uh, technologists from the war effort, and we had to do something, so we shoved them into civil society. We had dramatic shifts in political and economic structures. A lot of the old European-based structures were broken after the Second World War, and we built new ones. The world economy became uh, established on capitalist and neoliberal economic principles, and they've now become the dominant or indeed the sole economic principles on which the entire world is, is organized. And we started putting things into pri the private system, commoditizing public goods and so on. But more than anything, it was probably the growth imperative. Increasing consumption per capita has become a dominant value in most societies around the world. We tried to put this into a simple diagram. This is indeed a very, very simple diagram. And it, I think any, any social scientist would, would tell you that this is maybe even too simple. But nevertheless, it's, we've tried to capture what the Great Acceleration is all about. It's really this, this red feedback loop here between population and production consumption. We're having more and more people, which means we're having more production and consumption simply because we have more people. But then individually, each person is actually consuming more as well. So it accelerates this whole loop. We need energy to drive the loop. And indeed, this has become the nexus of the climate change problem. But sitting behind all this in yellow is knowledge, science, technology, which are increasing at a fast rate. And also, this blue is very important. You need institutions and, pl and a political economy that's working well to grease the wheels of this cycle. And if you don't think this is important, you can just think to, the, to what happened in the Soviet Union when it collapsed in 1990, in that it had an institutional breakdown its own political economy broke down. And this cycle within the Soviet Union really slowed down quite significantly. Economic growth went down. Uh, indeed, life expectancies went down. And Russia uh, was losing population. So this is actually a very important part of the whole equation. Another way of, of, of trying to put all this together is to look at what's called the, the, the global footprint of humanity on the Earth. There's a group that does this. So what they do is they look at each of us individually and look on average, how much resource do we need in terms of the food we eat, the products we consume, and so on? How much land does it take to produce that? And how much seed does it take to produce that too? So they actually measure it in terms of hectares. But also, how much land and how much sea and how much atmosphere does it take to absorb the wastes that we produce? Things like carbon dioxide, nitrogen compounds, and so on. And they can actually come up with a number for uh, people from various countries around the world, add it up, and then determine how many planet Earth do you need, because we know how many hectares of land and sea there are on Earth. And here's the result from 1960 to 2001. And this measured in number of planet Earths, and this blue line is the whole Earth. And you see that we were consuming about half of planet Earth's resources, renewable resources, by 1961. Somewhere in the 1980s, we hit one planet Earth, and we're now about 1.2 planet Earths. And you say, well, we've only got one. How can we be at 1.2? Well, that's telling us we're actually overshooting the capacity of the Earth to provide resources for us on an ongoing basis. In other words, we're eating into the natural capital. If you want to use a financial analogy, it means that if you want to live forever, or, or your family and descendants live forever off an endowment, 
you live off the interest, the income that's generated. You don't in, eat into the endowment because if you keep e eating it into it, it goes to zero and you've lost everything. Well, since about 1980, we're eating into the natural capital of the Earth's endowment. That can keep us going for a while, but it certainly can't keep us going indefinitely. Now, the interesting thing is you can take this concept and break it down by country, and that's what has happened here. You can see, in fact, the names of the countries. So this, again, is the number of planet Earths, with the dotted line being one planet Earth. Here it's simply in the, in the global hectares that I talked about per, per person. So somewhere around two is our allotment for each of us, given the present world population. Now this horizontal axis is a thing called the Human Development Index. And that's because there is a good reason we use resources. That is, we want to pull people out of poverty. We want to have better well-being well and so on. And there is an index that's been developed by the United Nations Development Program, which is based on things like health, life expectancy, um, income, education level, and so on. Uh, and an aggregate of 0.8 is thought to be uh, the, the borderline where you've got your society to a reasonably good state. So you see the whole drive is to move societies, and here you see a lot of poor African ones, upwards past this 0.8 threshold. You see a quite interesting curve, is that as you do so, you start consuming more and more. And the dilemma is, by the time you hit the index of well-being you want to be at, you've blown your ecological index. So that's the, fu the fundamental sustainability dilemma. And countries simply shoot past what's called the su sustainable development quadrant. So in a nutshell, this is the global dilemma, the sustainability dilemma, of which climate change is one symptom, but only one symptom. There are others. So now let me switch gears a bit and talk for uh, 15 minutes or so to conclude on this idea of Anthropocene stage three. We defined the Anthropocene as starting from 1800, because that's when we learned to access fossil fuels, that's when we developed <coughs> internal combustion engines, uh, and that's when this whole new energy system really took off. Stage two was the Great Acceleration. That started about 1950. And Western countries certainly have benefited enormously from the Great Acceleration. Countries like India and China, which a lot of people would like to blame now for the environmental problems, are only doing what the Western countries have already done. They're starting their own Great Accelerations uh, and pulling people out of poverty as they do so. But we're entering an Anthropocene stage three, and why do we define this as a new stage? We define it as a new stage because we now realize uh, that we're affecting our own environment at the global scale. We've become self-reflective. Back at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, people had no idea this would lead to a global problem. The first things they hit were local pollution, air pollution, water pollution, and of course, health suffered and they did something about it. But there was no idea that eventually we would have a global problem to deal with. Now, with modern satellite technology, with modern science, high-speed communication, ability to monitor the planet as a whole, we now know that we are affecting the Earth in the very many different ways that I've just described. So we're becoming reflective. We're attempting to manage ourselves in some way or another. The whole process of the Kyoto Protocol, the Copenhagen meeting in, in December, are parts of our movement into Anthropocene Stage 3, trying to manage our relationship with planet Earth. The Montreal Convention vis-a-vis -vis the ozone hole and chlorofluorocarbons are another example. And there are other conventions to protect biodiversity and so on. We're at the beginning of, of saying, we can't keep going the way we've been going. We've got to do something differently, or else it'll ultimately affect our own well-being. So this is Anthropocene stage three. I put up here sustainability or collapse, because now we're making this big push towards becoming more sustainable. But that isn't agreed by everybody. You hear a lot of denialists out, for example, on the climate change issue, uh, saying there's nothing to worry about. Well, we can look at societies in the past and see how they've handled their challenges and what we can learn from them. This is an example of just one of them. This is the Norse colony in Greenland, which was established around the year 1000 by Eric the Red, the Viking who came across from Iceland. And it was an unusually warm few centuries, medieval warm period. And so they established a European style medieval society uh, on the outskirts of Greenland. They survived for about 400 years and then they collapsed very quickly. In fact, the last written message from Greenland received by uh, relatives in Iceland was of a marriage that was in fact done in this particular church. Uh, and everything seemed fine, people were happy, it was a, obviously an occasion of great joy, uh, and then it was, there was a very quick collapse. 
So when collapses come, they can come fast. And there's still debate among scholars as to what drove the Greenland Norse into collapse. But we're starting to understand what happened to other civilizations like the Roman, like the Mayan, and so on. Here's some examples of three of them where we've charted through time the progress of various civilizations. This top one's in East Africa. This is the famous one. This is the Mayan civilization in Yucatan, Mexico. This one's in the Middle East, present-day Syria. But the vertical axis is simply a, a proxy measurement of the climate, of when the climate was dry and when it was wet. And these are all patterns of natural variability in these parts of the world. But you can see that in each case, when things got dry, uh, societies collapsed in these cases. Here's a long dry period in the Yucatan, which knocked out the Mayan civilization. Here's a very sharp, reasonably short in geological time, dry period, uh, which caused the Akkadian imperialization to collapse, and then they resettled afterwards. So humanity has faced uh, stress before. These, this is environmental stress. They faced other stress from enemies, uh, loss of trade, and so on. Some societies have remade themselves. A lot of Southeast Asian and Asian societies faced similar droughts, but they didn't collapse. They invented the intricate uh, irrigation you see on Bali, you see in parts of Indonesia, you see in Philippines. They remade their institutions, they developed new ways of using water, uh, and they transformed themselves and survived without the big drop in population, dispersion, a lot of death, uh, and resettlement, which is what happened to the Romans, the Mayans, and so on. So humanity can do either. And one of the great research topics now is understanding what are the determinants of that, because it isn't just the environmental change, it's the internal dynamics of the societies that confer either resilience or rigidity on them. And we don't have good answers yet. There are some ideas. Uh, and here's some of the really interesting ones, I think. Joe Tainter, who's an American scholar, has looked at a lot of these civilizations. And he reckons that it's increasing complexity and rigidity uh, that really gets you into trouble. Now, when you're a fairly simple agrarian society and you face some, some challenges, the thing humans invariably do is increase the complexity of the system to deal with the challenge. Up to a point that's actually very good and it's a very ad good adaptive tool. But Taylor argues there's a point at which it costs you more to manage the complexity you've created uh, than it does to solve the problem in a different way. And one of the modern examples he cites is modern day security after the 2001 attacks on New York. And we all uh, experience that when we fly these days. Uh, it's a hugely complex system, very expensive, um, and there's no evidence that it's actually diminished terrorism in any way terrorists have just gone on doing different things. So is this making our society more rigid, more costly, uh, more prone to, to breakdowns in various ways? And there are other, uh, other theories on why societies collapse. Jared Diamond's got an interesting one, inflexibility of core societal values. Societies have certain values. In the, in the case of the Greenland Norse, the argument was they had a European lifestyle. They imported cattle. They tried to grow crops in a European sense. Whereas when it got cold, the Inuit, the native peoples, could hunt seals, uh, they could hunt uh, whales, uh, and so on, and they were able to survive. Uh, now, there actually there's some interesting evidence that the Norse tried to do that too, that they weren't all that inflexible, but they probably weren't as skilled as the Inuits at doing it. So um, one of the arguments, though, is that if you can't change your core societal values facing a challenge, you're bound to collapse. And the classic case is our own society. I mentioned one of the core societal values is that's continual growth. And in a limited planet, is that a smart thing to do? And should we think very carefully about that core value in terms of maybe what type of growth, there are different types of growth, what type of growth might be better than other types of growth? And you can read some of the other uh, hypotheses that people have made. But it may vary from society to society, what makes them resilient, what makes them prone to collapse. Well, now let's just turn to our society and look at what's going, going on this century. First of all, we are hitting some resource constraints. This is a very well-known one. This, this is oil, petroleum. Uh, and the big orange circles are the original um, supplies or resource of petroleum in various countries. Here you see the biggies. There's the United States, Saudi Arabia, Soviet Union, and some other Middle East states. The black in the middle is how much oil is remaining. You can see visually, just instantly, doing a quick uh, sum in your heads, that we're, if we're not hitting peak oil now, we'll hit it pretty soon, because we've roughly used half of the oil that's readily recoverable on the planet. But also, you see the geopolitics quite clearly. 
Here's where there's a huge demand and where they've used up almost all of their oil. This is where the oil remains. So it doesn't take a, an Einstein to work out you're going to get some geopolitical tensions over that particular situation. Other things are happening to modern society too. We're uh, becoming globalized at an ever increasing rate. This is one of the most interesting interpretations of modern uh, uh, society done by the Swedish Institute of International Affairs uh, in which more and more people and their societies and sub-societies are floating up into this globalized community typified by the internet, international travel, international trade, the WTO world and so on. Two things to note, however, over half of humanity is still down in pre-modern societies, including parts of China, India, much of Africa, and so on. There's still an enormous amount of poverty around the planet. But the other interesting thing is there's a very small percentage, probably a bit less than 1%, maybe approaching it, who are floating out of the globalized community in terms of their major allegiance being the national, uh, national nation states to Australia, to US, to Germany, to whatever, and now their major Allegiance are to multinational companies, uh, often in the resource industries. Uh, and I've actually experienced, experienced this going to give presentations on global change to some of these industry groupings and sitting around with them at dinner. It's clear that they talk about their life as part of this company rather than their, their life as being from Scotland, Norway, Saudi Arabia, or wherever. Quite interesting phenomenon. But basically, there's a real dichotomy now growing around the world about where the planet is heading and where it should be headed. And this is a sort of a stylized diagram of those who think in terms of resources, ecology, we're overstretching uh, the capacity of Earth to support us, and those who believe that uh, ever onwards with new technologies and better economic instruments and we can solve the problem. And you can see that there's a, a, a strongly different percep perception about the Earth from those two groups. But it's not that simple, of course. And this uh, figure here is an interesting one from a colleague of mine in the Netherlands. What he's done is simply at the turn of the century, turn of the millennium, uh, taken newspaper headlines and magazine headlines to say, just to capture in sound bites how people look at the world in extremely different ways. And you can see uh, people who are looking at clash of civilization, fortress world, battlefields, turbulent neighborhoods, thinking about terrorism, thinking about border wars, thinking about resource wars. And then they're the ones saying the end of history, market world, new, globali new glo global age, the optimists who say more technology, more innovation, more growth, and we'll just be just fine. And then here's our, our common future people, uh, the people who are thinking about sustainability, ecologically driven lifestyles, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see, you can see elements of this in modern society, virtually all modern societies. There is no clear pathway, there's no clear consensus about where humanity is actually going. You can see all of, these, all of these strands if you look. So we're starting the 21st century really in a very chaotic state, uh, which probably explains part of the reason we're having so much trouble as a global community coming to any sort of agreement on issues like climate change, biodiversity, and so on. But what are some of the challenges? I just mentioned, bi mentioned biodiversity. It's been overshadowed by the climate change issue, but it's at least as important, I would argue maybe even more important, um, because it's on, uh, upon ecosystem services that we depend for our well-being. Produces our food, produces our clean air, produces our clean water, provides a lot of services that we simply can't do without. Uh, and when you look at the historical extinction rate, because species do go extinct naturally, uh, there's a rate to that, and we can back that out from the fossil record, somewhere between a tenth and one um, uh, species went extinct for every thousand mammal species every millennium. So that's sort of the yardstick that we use. <coughs> but right now, when we look at that, we're probably a hundred times greater than that. In other words, the extinction rate we experience now before climate change, this is simply due to habitat change uh, by humans, is now a hundred times the fossil record. So we already have an extinction crisis even without climate change. When you add in climate change, we're predict predicting something like a thousand times more background level. This is equivalent to the other five great extinction events that, have, that the Earth has seen, uh, such, uh, such as the one that knocked out the dinosaurs about 65 million years ago. But again, this is evidence of the Anthropocene. This is the first of those extinction events that's been, been driven by a biological species and not by a big geophysical event. There's the ice I showed you before, but if we look at the recent record, we see that the rate at which that's being lost, which is a back, back line, is much faster than any of the model projections for the future. And now estimates of, of when this might be 
be completely ice free, 100% loss of ice in summertime, somewhere around the 2030s. Whereas here you see the estimate is around 2100 or so. So the Earth system starting to move a bit faster than we had thought. Uh, we see it in the, the big ice sheets on Greenland and Antarctica. Here's a case of where ice shelves on the Antarctic Peninsula are being lost. There's the Larsen B, uh, remnant of the Larsen B. And as that, that happens, you get a speed up of the glaciers coming off the land, sort of like a cork in the bottle analogy. And so there's concerns that some of these big ice sheets are mobilizing. Here's the one in, in Greenland, which is, is losing ice at a fairly fast rate. Um, these orangey warm colors are areas where there's actually a loss of mass. And we're using some very clever techniques now to do this. Uh, we're actually using gravimetric measurements very subtly. Uh, the gravitational field changes as you gain or lose mass. And so we can get a handle on what's happening to these ice sheets. Now these bluey areas are actually where there's a bit more ice because there's a bit more snowfall uh, as the hydrological cycle uh, intensifies in the northern latitudes. But overall, the aggregate is that we're losing ice at an increasing rate, again, much like that uh, graph I just showed you for the Arctic sea ice. We're now approaching somewhere between 200 and 300 cubic kilometers of ice a year that's being lost from Greenland, and of course contributing to sea level rise. Uh, one of the processes there that, uh, uh, that's, that's pushing that along is the melting on the surface of the Greenland ice and then these streams and rivers flowing down through crevasses and lubricating uh, the base of the ice on the bedrock, and it's flowing a little bit more quickly. One way we can look at the future is to, to use this so-called night lights <coughs> diagram. This, by the way, is a very good proxy of CO2 emissions uh, from energy, because this is where energy is largely consumed. So this is actually a real image from NASA, taken about the year 2000. It's a composite, of course, because it's not nighttime everywhere, so you've got to put these images together. And this is what you get if, if, if it could be nighttime everywhere simultaneously. You see Eastern US, Western Europe, and Japan, parts of Asia are really the areas where a lot of energy is being used. You can see Australia's sparse population here, and you can just see the capital cities lighting up, but not much else. Now what we can do is put this energy change in a, in a millennial scale perspective. This is a, one realization of that earlier graph I showed you of the long-term northern hemisphere temperature record with that spike that was shown in red on the other diagram. This is the same data here. I'm going to use that as a reference point and then go forward. So what we want to do is now digitize these night lights. Uh, it's exactly the same NASA image year 2000. So this is real data, but it's been put into a computer so we can manipulate it. And what we'll do now is we'll take one of the energy scenarios, business as usual, for 2070. So it's now about 60 years into the future from where we are now. And what we'll do is we'll take the projection of energy usage on business as usual if we don't do anything to evade emissions. We'll then go backwards and say, knowing how much energy and where it's going to be used, we can convert that back into night lights. So I can generate now a night lights in 2070 for business as usual. So this is what it's going to look like. Watch what happens as we go forward. There we go. That's business as usual. So everyone's worried about India and China. So you certainly see India light up, see more China light up. If I go back, watch what happens to the big consumers of energy already. So I'll see if I can go back. No, it's going the wrong way. Yeah. So watch what happens to US, Europe, and Japan, for example. They don't stand still. So it truly is a global problem. It's not a problem of any one country or any one region. You still see that we're pretty small bickies on the, on the global scene. But per capita, we're actually not. We're fairly big emitters. Now what we can do then is use a climate model to take the emissions from that graph that I showed you and make some estimates of what's going to happen to climate. So there's the reference point. Here's natural variability. That's the envelope there of, of uh, the systems that we depend upon. That's their world. Here's where we are now. As I said, we're just outside that envelope of natural variability. This orange wedge are the IPCC projections out to 2100. So I've put this on the same time scale. So you can get a feel for the magnitude and rate of change which is being projected compared to natural variability. So here's where we are now. This is actually committed. That's in the pipeline simply because of momentum in the climate system. And you can see as you go up that scale that things start happen to happen as you go up. And these are my estimates of what happens at various temperature levels. If we hit five degrees, I think uh, modern civilization can't, won't be able to handle that. It's so far outside of anything we've experienced or dealt with uh, that will probably collapse. 
Now, where are we tracking? These are the observed emissions. This red line here is the business as usual uh, out to 2050, and we start hitting some resource constraints there. But in fact, the observed emissions are tracking at precisely that level. These colored lines are how we would have to reduce emissions to keep uh, the Earth at 450. This is roughly 2 degrees, 3 degrees, 4 degrees, very roughly. So all the hoo-ha you hear about targets, and you hear a lot of debate about the government's proposals and so on, it has to do with these trajectories. Where do we want to be in 2020? Where do we want to be in 2050? Okay, and there's great debate about that. But the point is, we're tracking here, and we're at whatever targets you think are okay, even moderate ones, are actually a huge change from the direction we're going now. And we're tracking also at the very upper level of what the climate models say for temperature and sea level rise. We now have about 20 years of data. These are the uh, uncertainties of the model projections, and the solid lines are the observations. That's what we actually, uh, actually observe. Temperature's tracking at the upper limit, sea level at the upper limit of what the projections are saying. So we're heading toward the top level of those projections. Well, just to close, we did some work on this here at ANU at the Fenner School, saying, going back to that curve, saying, there's an enormous amount of talk about climate change, about biodiversity loss, about land degradation, about all these things. And we try to do something about them, but yet we cannot turn those curves around. They still go up and up and up. And so we model this in, in the following way, that any sort of a degree of unsustainability, whether it's land degradation, whether it's invasive species, whether it's carbon dioxide in the atmosphere or whatever. You've got a curve going up and you know you've got to turn it around. And you also know there's probably some limit that you don't want to go over. And you still shoot over that limit. And we take some policy actions. We do things about degradation. We put in some more nature reserves. Uh, we put some incentives for renewable energies. But yet most of these are very short-term policy actions for a few years with limited amounts of money and all we do is maybe tweak this curve a little bit, but in fact it continues to go up. When in fact really what we've got to do is turn it around like this and bring it back down. Now those who argue that the 2020 targets of say the US and even Australia are too modest don't understand how tough those targets really are. Because we, like any other developed country, is shooting up this way, or most developed countries, I should keep the Scandinavian countries out because they're probably already bending their curves downwards. But we've got a big job to do just to get back down, say, to 1990 or 2000 levels when the momentum is carrying us this way. So when President Obama says he wants to get the U.S. back to 1990 levels by 2020, that is an enormous task. It sounds like not much, and it may be short of what's required, but nevertheless, it's an enormous task. Well, what's missing? Why can't we bend those curves? We argued in our, our research that it's the so-called long-term and foundational issues, the issues that the humanities deal with, and that's really what we're missing. <coughs> One way to look at it is this way, that instead of the triple bottom line that you hear about in sustainability, economic, social systems, and environment, you have to balance them. It's actually not a balancing act, it's a hierarchy. You've got to have a fundamentally sound environment, a life support system, or everything else is irrelevant you simply can't live. You have to have a really well-functioning social system to have a good economy. And people forget that. They think it's the other way around. You have to have a good economy to have a good social system. No, it's the other way around. Look at the Soviet Union. Once its social system collapsed, its economy went with it, not the other way around. So this, in a way, turns the whole argument on its head. We should be worrying far less about the economy and far more about the environment and a good social system, and the economy will come along. So I'll just close. Sustainability or collapse? The future will depend, depend on these long-term issues. It'll depend on technology. It'll depend on econo economic instruments. It'll depend on a lot of other nuts and bolts things. But ultimately, it will depend on the nature of our aspirations. Where do we want to be? What sort of societies do we want? It'll depend on our core values. It'll depend on our preferences and the choices that we make. So really what we're saying is that this is not a marginal problem, this problem of sustainability. It's not something that you do uh, just on the weekends after you've dealt with the more immediate economic problems. It's a fundamental problem about where society is going uh, and whether it will in fact transform itself this century or whether it's headed for collapse. Well, thanks very much. I'll stop there. We do have time and I'm happy to take some questions.
understand that 90% of, of greenhouse gas is in fact uncondensed water vapour and CO2 is only 1% of the greenhouse gas, the 1% increase in CO2 in the, since the Industrial Revolution. Is it? Uh, and I also understand that trees of uh, natural cloud cedars. Do you think it's humans mucking around with water fluxes on the surface of the planet, which is no. a major problem? No, the water fluxes do change, but they've changed in response to the uh, radiative forcing of, of uh, carbon dioxide and the other greenhouse gases. Uh, that, that we know with a high degree of confidence. In fact, I was involved in a paper that looked at exactly that question, saying how have humans modified water vapor flow as opposed to damming rivers and fiddling around with liquid water. And our conclusion was quite clear. We have not changed it uh, through direct action. The reason being uh, the, the amount of increased water vapor flow that we have engendered through irrigation is almost precisely balanced by the amount we've lost through deforestation. So the climate system as a whole feels no change in aggregate from direct human activities. What it does feel is, is a change in radiative forcing that now amounts to about 1.5 watts per square meter uh, due to carbon dioxide uh, and when you add in the other greenhouse gases and take off the cooling effect of aerosols of air pollution get back to about 1.5 meters. What that does is it warms the planet uh, a bit and that increases the hydrological cycle. There's more evaporation so there's more water vapor indeed there but it's a secondary effect uh, from the carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas uh, increase. Uh, you're, you're absolutely incorrect on the 1%. Uh, the way you calculate CO2 is in parts per million and what you do is you look at the envelope of natural variability of CO2. Uh, and in the Lake Quaternary, which is the time that fully modern humans have been on the planet, it's very between 180 and 280 parts per million. And you can calculate the change in, in radiative forcing at the surface. Um, we can do that in a physical chemistry lab actually here at ANU because you, you know these gas properties very well. We've gone from 280 to 385. So we've doubled the operating range, natural operating range. That's the number that's uh, that's important. Uh, percentages are absolutely irrelevant. It's the actual physical quantity of radiation that's absorbed by these gases that's a critical thing. That affects the climate system. So we have, in fact, uh, made a huge change uh, to the greenhouse gas concentrations when you look at it that way. Uh, much faster than nature does. Nature varies, as I said, between 180 and 280. We've gone from 280 to 385 uh, in a fraction of the time uh, that it takes for CO2 to vary between ice ages and warm periods. Well, would you be able, would you care to speculate on what the situation would be with a total collapse of, uh, of civilization and the global system? It doesn't mean uh, is it going to be ever recoverable because, I'm, you know, there's about a CO2 in the air, and if you lose swathes of species, and very, even with a very small population, is there any? Yeah, um, it's real speculation, I know. Well, it, it's hard to say. I mean, over long, long periods of time. What we'll do is we'll see a spike, just like you see in the geological record, spikes of natural phenomenon like uh, a meteorite strike or maybe enormous outgassing of methane from a change in, in ocean circulation or whatever. Uh, and, and the Earth has done this in the past. You've seen some big spikes of, of environmental change. Uh, and I think the human uh, experiment now will be viewed as a big spike uh, in the future. Now, that doesn't help us because our own time frame, of course, is a human lifespan and those of our children and grandchildren. That's what we're concerned about. So we're in the midst of a, a spike, if you like. So getting back to that time frame, CO2, it will not recover to the 280 for um, a thousand years or more, probably. Uh, and that's simply because it's a non-reactive gas, unlike methane and others. It's already oxidized. Uh, and so you've got to requi it requires geological processes in the long term to rig it out, weathering, formation of carbonate, uh, and so on. And that takes a long time. The Earth will do it, but it takes a long, long time uh, in terms of human lifespan. Species, the Earth has re-speciated after each of the other five extinction events, but it takes a long time. There are depauperate ecosystems for millennia after these events. So yes, the Earth will, I think, re-speciate, uh, but nowhere near it, the time frame that we would like it to be. <coughs> um, yeah, with regards to uh, sustainability or collapse, I think it's hard for a lot of people to sort of conceptualize what collapse would mean. Is there a way you could paint a brief picture of what it would be like, like on the ground level? Yeah, uh, the, the best picture I could paint, and the only one I could tell from any experience was having worked, when I was working internationally, working in the former Soviet Union, in a few years, very soon after its collapse. Uh, and what did it mean? Uh, first of all, for me as a researcher and academic, it meant that my colleagues had 
jobs but no income. So universities were still there, research institutes were still there. They had zero income. They tried to keep going. They worked outside uh, pumping petrol or whatever they could do, tilling fields, just to keep a wee bit of income to try to keep their families going. Uh, currency broke down. People were trading things. You go to the streets of Moscow and you'd see markets just sprang up with people bringing things in from the hinterland and trading. Uh, you saw really enormous poverty uh, in, in the midst of um, some of the old uh, major cities of the Soviet Union. Uh, but in a way, you saw resilience too. The Russians are pretty tough people. They've been through some, some tough times before. But certainly, what you saw were lifespans going down. People were dying younger. Um, you saw an out, a movement out of population, particularly a lot of young researchers that I knew uh, flooded to the West. They lost a generation of researchers uh, that they still are trying to recover from. So you, you can see things from really what was a mild collapse, because you have to remember that the Soviet Union was embedded in a, in a globalizing system that helped pull them out. You know, they only experienced the really rough part a decade or so. And, and now they're, they're coming out quite strongly, but unevenly. So that's one area. You can go to African countries like Rwanda. Zimbabwe is probably a good case now of, of a society under collapse of various types. It isn't that the whole thing just falls apart. It's that a lot of the institutions fall apart. People move away. Um, they have, uh, uh, they have less, um, less income uh, and so on. Uh, in the past, what about the collapse of the Romans? Well, they didn't totally disappear. They reemerged as Venice and other places which rebuilt as city-states. So you see really uh, a, a, an uncontrollable drop in income, in ability to, um, to manipulate your environment and, and so on, all the things we, we value for societies a dispersion of population and then a slow rebuilding of a new system or fragmentary system somewhere else. So, so really the, the critical thing about a collapse is it's uncontrollable. The institutions can't control what's happening. Uh, a very, very mild form was the free fall in the stock market during this fin global financial crisis. That was uncontrollable. Nobody could control it. But it was very mild because it was only the shadow economy. It wasn't the real economy. It's affected the real economy, but it's nowhere near uh, the sort of collapses we're talking about now. Um, in following this debate, we've been watching how time is becoming increasingly frustrating for the society. And in um, Copenhagen this evening, I don't know whether it was actually reported on their website or, or from uh, the um, news reports around the world, but there was talk of the scientists there actually getting together and meeting about a month later, so to really up the ante in terms of applying pressure to the government. Is that going ahead? No, I don't know about any meeting. Um, I am involved in a small group that's writing the report from that meeting. Uh, that could be what we're referring to. We're trying to get that together by uh, early June. The Danish government will release it in mid-June, and it'll go to all the negotiating teams from countries around the world. Um, but I think it's, it's a difficult one for, for scientists. I think pressure's probably not quite the right word. Uh, you need some honest brokers in this, and so I think what we need to do is stick to um, doing the most accurate science we can say and, and saying, these are the consequences of various policies, rather than saying you should take this policy. Uh, and I like to put it in the risk framework. I think the, the risks of, of doing nothing at all are, are very, very big indeed. Uh, and if society is willing to take those risks, so be it. But then I think they're going to really face a high probability of collapse. Um, and, and those are the sort of points I try to make. Um, I wouldn't tell, for example, the Australian government or the US government, you ought to have a 5%, 15 or 25% target by uh, 2020. I think that's less important than actually just getting started uh, on, on dealing with the problem. So I think there's a, there's a difficult situation that scientists are in. Uh, once you become too strong in, an advocate for various political positions, then you lose your authority, I think, as a scientist. And that's one of the issues that we face. Your talk was an excellent and terrifying synthesis of the problems that we all face. Thank you very much. And I'm just wondering, it's going to be published anywhere, or can you give it to our politicians and policy makers? Well, bits, bits of it have been published. Uh, the bits on global change are published in a book in 2004 published by Springer. Yeah. Uh, the, the stages of the Anthropocene was published a year or so ago in, in Ambio um, by myself, Paul Critson, who's the uh, chemist who won the Nobel Prize for the ozone hole, and John McNeil, who's an eminent historian of the 20th century. So we put that together. So bits of it are published. Um, but thanks for the challenge. Maybe this is something we ought to try to put the whole thing together. But if I had time, yes. <laughs> <laughs>
in relation to the, the research theme of this series, uh, you, you pointed out that, uh, that uh, our predictions uh, or reality is right at the top of our predictions, which suggests that there are still some serious unknowns in there and, and there is some criticism even coming from various expertise that, that uh, the models are under predicting. What are the main areas that we still uh, are not understanding properly? Why aren't those models working properly still? Well, they work pretty well given the complexity of the system. Um, so I wouldn't uh, discount that. But y there are uncertainties. The gentleman here referred to one of them, and that's the clouds. Uh, in terms of fast feedbacks, uh, the water, va water vapor feedback we know pretty well, but the cloud feedback we don't know very well. There's a lot more work to be done on cloud dynamics, the types of clouds that are formed, uh, in, in what controls their formation. One of the things are uh, aerosols emitted by, by natural vegetation, but there are a lot of other things that affect uh, cloud formation as well. And depending on what type of cloud it is or, and where it is in the atmosphere, it can either cool or warm further the climate. So there's still a lot of uncertainty around that. Um, and that leads then to the uncertainty around what's uh, called climate sensitivity. If you double CO2, by how much would global mean temperature rise at equilibrium after the climate system had a uh, chance to, to equilibrate? And those vary from a, a degree and a half, which isn't too bad, up to eight or nine degrees. Uh, but the bulk of them are now converging around three degrees. And in fact, the evidence from the past, from the ice age, warm period transition, pretty much pegs it at three degrees. So that's getting to be a, a, a good figure. So in terms of the, the fast feedbacks, it's the clouds that are big unknown. In terms of the longer term feedbacks, there are two huge areas of uncertainty. One of the ice sheets, how fast can they change? Uh, nobody knows. Uh, and the second are carbon cycle feedbacks, which are new sources of carbon, like the methane that's stored in permafrost. We simply don't know how stable that is yet. And so in longer term, uh, past 2100, uh, there are some very big uncertainties, and that's why we, we can only put this uh, problem in terms of a risk analysis at present. Can you predict some of the key technologies or mix of technologies or alternate source of energy which you can say will make life sustainable in the short term, maybe a decade or two, on which you are depending on? I yeah. Are depending on. Um, there was some really good discussion about this at Copenhagen, so I'll report what the, the people there uh, reported. One is there are a number of technologies that can be rolled out today, tomorrow, and are being rolled out. Um, one is energy efficiency, which is often forgotten about. It isn't so much a technology, but practices and management. Uh, and you can make a lot of gains very, very quickly, overnight almost, uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, redoing buildings, turning off lights, all these sort of things. You can probably gain 10, 15% reductions in emissions straight away without, in fact, you probably even improve the economy because you save money from wasteful practices. In terms of technologies, while well, the meeting was in Copenhagen and you stepped out of the front door of the conference center and there was a giant wind generator uh, in front of you, uh, so Denmark, for example, is generating 20% of its power now by wind. Um, obviously, there are challenges to grid systems when you put in intermittent renewable sources. Uh, people are working on that. In fact, there's a talk about a super grid slash smart grid uh, that Europe is thinking about in conjunction with North Africa using all present day technologies but new grid technologies. Uh, DC current, high voltage to minimize losses. But it's a combination of solar thermal, solar PV, wind, um, some geothermal, and hydro. And that combination, all of which is, uh, is feasible now, uh, at getting to be fairly competitive cost, costings, uh, they reckon they can run Europe on that uh, with virtually zero emission. And if you throw in the French, of course the French have nuclear power, um, which is being used now. It generates about 70% of their electricity. Uh, so there are mixes of things that can be used. Nuclear, of course, is quite good for base load. Uh, but by having a large enough grid and by having different renewables, uh, you can pretty much stabilize the grid. So the answer is yes, there are a lot of technologies now. Uh, pricing is a constraint, and the argument there is we don't price the damage that carbon does. So once there's a price signal on carbon, those others become even more economically viable. <coughs> The message I'm getting from this and many other presentations is, of course, there are trade-offs. 
So we lose on one side and gain elsewhere. Uh, the critical thing is to understand the threshold for integrity system and to rely on scientists of all kinds to identify all those. We cannot solve all the problems. We have to sort of zoom in, uh, zoom on some uh, smaller matrix of things. Uh, in terms of designing policy and understanding uh, what are the critical needs at this moment and the future, we have to identify those, uh, that, that matrix of uh, problems and possible solutions. I understand you put that last slide to, uh, you know, uh, to enlighten us what uh, we can do, but it's very, in my understanding, very vague. So can you sort of uh, give your opinion? What are the critical uh, Issues you're looking at into and what are the solutions? Okay, I would I would sort of respond to that by saying I think doing that to a large degree is actually the problem. What we don't want to do is prioritize and put things in silos. We have to integrate. Uh, we can't separate the biodiversity issue from the climate change issue. We can't set, separate either of those from the poverty reduction issue. Is that there are many people in the world who legitimately need to. Uh, get out of poverty as fast as they can. So you can't say, oh, we'll do with the climate issue, and oops, by the way, you guys can't develop for the next 40 years till we get emissions under control. You can't do that. And you say, for example, what you also can't do is say, let's use the biosphere to soak up carbon, and at the same time, um, knock out even more biodiversity because you're putting in biofuels, or knock out food production because you're putting in biofuels. I think th th the demand now is to deal with the complexity itself and not try to prioritize, make things simpler. Our, our, our brains, have, because of the way we organize knowledge systems, including universities, in departments, in silos, we're used to doing that. But that's the problem. We now have to become much more integrated. Uh, and one of the things we're trying to do at the Fenner School, uh, and that's the, the unit at ANU that, in fact, puts things together. It has natural scientists, social scientists, econ economists, and humanities scholars. Those people have to work together. And we have to have institutions that work together out in the non-academic world. So I would argue that the challenge is integration uh, and dealing with complexity uh, rather than prioritizing and saying, let's solve this and forget about the other ones for the time being. That's, that's disaster. Thank you very much, Will, and thank you all for coming. I found it very interesting. And you've, you're right with Phil? Okay, are you happy with the way his jacket's sitting at the moment? Are you moment? happy with the jacket? Yeah. Just the tie is probably the only thing. What we'd like to tie. tie. Okay. Just, um, just the bottom of it. Just back to your right a little. Back to my right a yeah, bit? Yeah, that's the way. How's that? That's great. Okay, oh, now, I see what's happening here. Yeah. Now, the notebook there, do you have it there? Or yeah, I didn't mind it there. It's, it's a bit of a 